So this can't just swing. First apologies for the format. I have used the slides from very old slides. Back, I think it was three or four years ago when I delivered the lecture on politeness and culture. So these are the old format slides we used to use in Huddersfield. They look awful pink. No. Anyway, um, but the contents might be okay. Basically what I would like to do is to finish this talk short, relatively shortly or quickly, and then uh, the Indian team, so Rita Shatul and the rest of the folks would have time to to, to talk about the the the, um, the project itself because we would need to have a training session today instead of me just talking. Culture. Um, well, the thing is that uh, it might be a relevant factor in our projects. In general, politeness studies, culture is something very important. I have just talked to you about the first, second, and third wave approaches to politeness. And you might have seen that culture is an important factor in all these approaches. So it's imminent, it's, it's a, basically all, it's, it's there all the time in politeness studies. So it's something worth talking about. Now when it comes to our project, crime prevention and aggression, culture might be important. It's not, in the, not a first line phenomenon, so we would not like to start from culture. But we always start to discuss that um, if you want to create a crime prevention software, say, in, in Hindi, <coughs> we need to take Indian culture into account. Whatever Indian culture is, I would say, normative Indian culture is something which counts as, as a norm to most people in this country. It's definitely a factor we need to cope with. So in this talk, I'm just going to <coughs> talk about how we can theorize culture. And I do hope that it will also help us to take culture on board in our project. But just in case if your topic is unrelated to this project, that is something that may come up in your politeness or impoliteness um, research project by itself. Um, as, as I have already mentioned about first wave approaches, Brown and Levinson had a very overgeneralizing view about culture. So they said that, that in certain cultures we use politeness in this way and in others in that way. The same is valid to impoliteness. Later in second wave series, they said that there is no such a thing as culture, but if there is such a thing as a culture, it cannot be utilized as an analytic notion. Whereas in third way, CUE we say that culture is important because of the social practices. So social, practice, social practices are culturally situated. In our case, conventions and rituals, so the recurrent aspects of language are culturally situated. It seems to be quite crazy to ignore that culture has an important influence on what our language use. Um, politeness, when it comes to culture, we need to talk about metapragmatics as well. Because, you know what metapragmatics is? So the study of language use about language use. The problem is that when we talk about phenomena like aggression, conflict, conflict, uh, crime prevention, and so on, we use English as a lingua franca. However, in every language and culture, we have culture-specific equivalents for these notions. And it's worth thinking about whether we talk about the same phenomena. The same goes for politeness and impoliteness. In many languages, there are words for politeness and impoliteness. And these words have their culture-specific meanings and implications. This is why culture should be reconnoited, first of all, on the meta-pragmatic level. We need to be aware, we need to be clear about whether we are talking about the same phenomena or not. Let me, for example, discuss um, aggression as a phenomenon. Also, again, uh, culture is something quite intrinsic when it comes to politeness, impoliteness, aggression, and so on. Simply because politeness and, imp um, and impoliteness are not limited to speech acts and formal forms. We already agreed about this. But exactly because of this, culture 
seems to imbue our behavior beyond form. So it must be there on a broader, on a deeper layer of language use. It influences our social practices, which you might have seen it's a recurrent topic in, in, in this lecture series. Of course, when it comes to, for example, politeness, impoliteness, abuse, and so on, the best way to cope with culture and to, to avoid being un knowingly influenced by, by different culture understandings of a phenomenon is to create technical understandings of the phenomenon I study, what that we study. Like, for example, when it comes to aggression, it's important to distinguish aggression in a culture specific sense plus aggression in a more technical sense. In the case of our project, we need to talk about, about for example, aggression in a more technical sense rather than getting engaged in culture specific definitions of this phenomenon. However, the, what makes things a bit more complex is that we cannot fully ignore culture specific definitions of the phenomenon. Say, for example, when we talk about aggression in Hindi or Indian English, of course, simply because you guys work with us as an English team, we need to have a common understanding of what aggression is, which is, may not be influenced by culture specific understanding of, of, of this phenomenon. On the other hand, though, if we want to properly analyze aggression in Hindi, our technical and theoretical understandings of aggression still needs to be enriched by culture specific understandings of, of, of aggression. In other words, if we want to, uh, to prevent or develop a software which prevents aggression in Hindi, A, it needs to be, I mean, our definition of aggression needs to be exempt of culture as a notion, but on the other hand, it, needs, it has to be enriched by local culture specific understandings of this phenomenon. But these two operate on different layers. So there's a technical definition, and then there's an empirical definition. Does this make sense? Are you still with me? Cool. This culture thing, and you know, um, the importance of culture specificity versus culture generality has been there all the time in the debate around Brian and Levinson and in discursive um, approaches to politeness and impoliteness. Uh, as I have mentioned already, discursive scholars say that there is no such a thing as culture. But again, I do disagree with this. And in order to operationalize, say, a software we are working on, we need to cope with culture, but we need to put culture to its proper place <coughs> as a notion which, which, which contributes to our theoretical understandings of the phenomenon. Now in this brief talk, what I'm going to do is that I will first study the complexity of the notions of culture and politeness. This is quite important to discuss because people often write about, say, politeness in, in, in British culture, which is okay to write about, but we need to be self-reflexively aware that there are some potential glitches in such kind of descriptions. So if you, for example, want to write about threat in, in, in Hindi, we need to be careful about these complexities that surround politeness and impoliteness, behavior or interpersonal behavior and culture. Following this, I will examine the role of culture difference in the production of politeness. So why culture differences are important as we produce politeness and impoliteness. And finally, I will propose a combined micro and macro analytic approach to culture situated politeness and impoliteness simply by, by focusing on this social practice thing again. So it might sound it may sound repetitive occasionally, but I need to retrieve certain notions which which link around uh, politeness research. So culture, why is it complex? So for example if I say I'm a Hungarian who lives and works in England, am I supposed to speak like a Hungarian? And actually, how does a Hungarian speak? Or am I influenced by, by British culture? So living international lives is, uh, make, 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 makes us to realize these problems around culture. There is no such a thing as 
a sculpture full stop. What really surprised me and amazes me in, in India is that this, this country seems to be extremely multicultural. There are many local traditions, many religions, many people from, from, from different origins. It's amazing. So can we talk easily about Indian culture, for example, without acknowledging that India is an extremely multicultural place with so many histories and, and, and uh, different understandings of politeness and impoliteness, aggression and so on. Uh, in order to answer this problem, I would refer here to my study with Michael Ho, in which we argued that rather than operating as culture dopes, who are controlled by politeness norms of the culture in question, we take the view that we co construct understandings of politeness or impoliteness as representative of cultural identities through discourse and interaction itself. In other words, the relationship between politeness and culture is constituted through discourse. So yeah, if we want to capture this, this thing of culture, say Hindi culture or Indian culture, we really need to study culture as something enacted and co-constructed in interaction. So for example, I go back to our project. If we study threats in Indian culture, study recurrent phenomena as practices and culture as something which might be co-constructed in the course of these discourses, in the course of these interactions, instead of presupposing that these interactions take a certain shape because of culture. In other words, we need to find evidence for culture within our data. It's a kind of bottom-to-up approach bottom to top approach, as they call it in intercultural communication. When it comes to politeness, aggression, conflict, and so on, we definitely need to go bottom to top. We can't assume that there is such a thing as culture. Also, culture might be a resource. Say, when I read about, about these rape cases which started that conversation, I found that, oh, sorry. I found that that people referred to their motivation for raping victims as a cultural thing. So they said that, you know, in Indian culture, if the victim is not properly dressed, it's just a call for rape, really. So we are supposed to do this. So what's happening in this case? Is it really Indian culture they are talking about? Of course not. They are talking about their own understandings of Indian culture in order to sort of make a reasoning behind their behavior. And that's a big difference. And this showcases why culture is extremely complex as a phenomenon. Um, oh sorry. Um, so discursive co-construction. The good thing is that we are not culture dopes. So when it comes to culture, we often co-construct things in a kind of fluid way. And this is why culture is occasionally a plus to communication rather than something which, which puts people into a versus relationship. So for example, when there's an intercultural communication between myself and my Indian colleagues, it's of course intercultural, but does it mean that we have cultural problems? No. It's an addition, it's a plus, because we have little antennas for culture, and through these antennas we can understand, for example, when culture is used as a reasoning, as a discursive resource. It, these antennas help us to accommodate others' behavior. Here is an example of, from my, it's a personal anecdote on the, on the slide. Previously, when I moved to England, one of my colleagues asked me, you're right, and I just told you that in Hungarian culture, you are supposed to talk about yourself. So I started to talk to my colleagues, saying that, well, not really. We are still struggling to find the property, blah, 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 blah. And my colleague was in a short silence, We're like, ooh, okay. And then he responded, well, it is difficult to find an appropriate rental property in, in Huddersfield. And then I said, yeah. And then I we quickly stopped the conversation. So what was happening? My colleague found that there is something wrong. But it did not mean that the interaction broke down but instead, my colleague accommodated the situation. The short silence indicates that he was surprised, that even though he was surprised, the, 
But conversation continued, and I accommodated the situation as well by quickly closing the conversation. So we are not culture dopes. Culture is there in our language use, either on the level of social practices, or as we co-construct culture as a discursive resource. Okay, stop for a moment. Are you still with me? Great. Um, um, so culture differences. What, what, what about culture differences? In, if you open old-fashioned studies on politeness, written in the 1990s, say, they always talk about culture differences and how mm -hmm. and why politeness can be exotic, right, for some other people. I believe that this might not be the case because in real life people are fairly accommodative. So we just go with the flow and try to take on culture, the, the culture differences. In this sense, identity is, is an important phenomenon. So as we interact, we operate jointly in forming culture identities. So we sort of position ourselves in, in, in certain culture stances. We usually make use of positive or negative uh, identity practices, so we either associate ourselves with cultures or dissociate ourselves from that culture. Uh, association and dissociation, yeah, these are the basic cultural practices which we take. Again, I'm talking now about politeness as a resource, or sorry, a culture as a resource, we can take it on the board in order to attain something. Again, in the case of rape cases, you would say that I had to rape her because she dressed, un dressed in a non-nice way and this is unacceptable in the culture. This is a typical discursive resource. Now, when you make use of this discursive resource of culture, you attempt to associate yourself with the given culture. This kind of association pro process is also there in, in cases which are not, which are just general polite or impolite cases, which are not unrelated with our project. Say, previously, I had a conversation with one of my colleagues and I said in a Yorkshire accent, well done, as the Yorkshire people say. It, of course, was a kind of association practice and he was very happy that I tried to associate myself with locals. So this is what we do all the time and culture is there. It doesn't mean that we are culture that different. Like in this case, he was not absolutely Yorkshire, I wasn't absolutely foreign. It's not culture, it's just culture as it is co-constructed as we, as we interact. Um, there are, of course, well, let me go back for a moment for social practices. So there are normative differences when it comes to practices, and when it comes to practice of association and dissociation. Like, for example, okay, um, you may think that you, dis you associate with someone but even in that case, the given person may think that you have failed to associate properly yourself properly this, with this person, and this one depends on the moral orders, whether you, ask, whether you can fit your practice into the local moral order. I'm just going back to morality. Let me, okay, so for example, in this rape case, I told you this example that I had, we had to rape her because she did not dress properly and in our culture, if a woman is not dressed properly, she's basically a prostitute. Now in this case, of course, many people would say that this argument is rubbish, it's no good. We would all say that this is a crazy argument. Because although this person tries to associate himself with, with the culture in question, this violate, his behavior violates the moral order or moral behaviors, local moral behaviors. In other words, this association and this disassociation practice that is because they can what I'm talking about, and they may or may not work. Occasionally, we also stereotypically contrast people. So we aim to, for example, okay, here's an example on, on the screen from the film English Patient, in which two guys have a debate about uh, an excavation project in the desert. desert. So one of them says latitude 2533, longitude 2516. We attempt to drive northeast of Kofe, who will leave our bones in the deserts. And then the other says, I disagree. 
and the first speaker says you are Hungarian, you obey this agree. So it's, uh, okay, there is this stereotype of Hungarians, of, of, of people who disagree with others, there is a stereotype about, about yeah, my, my home culture. And in this case, of course, you make use of a stereotype and contrast this person with the other as a kind of argument. Again, is the culture element explicitly in the text? No. You use culture as a discursive resource, just as in the rape case. You use culture as an argument. You can make use of the culture, culture facts as an argument, either as, as uh, in the form of association or dissociation, or by contrasting someone or yourself with others. So there are all kinds of identity practices. Now, um, the, so far I was giving this impression that, you know, catch is always interactionally situated. It's true. So let me just recap what I was talking about. So catch can be used in association, dissociation, or contrasting as a resource to get things done, to make an argument, as in the case of the case as well. But this doesn't mean that catch doesn't exist. I'm just trying to give you and an idea of the complexity that surrounds culture. So irrespective of the fact that culture is complex, luckily there are recurrent patterns of behavior, right? And in these recurrent patterns of behavior which we study in this project, culture is nevertheless there. We just need to be aware that in, when we study these macro understandings of culture, they reflect a certain type of understanding, a certain type of of, of culture, but culture is potentially there in different forms in our data as well. And of course we can talk about conventionalization, but I have already talked about convention. So yeah, um, I think I'd better conclude here, because I don't want to talk too much at this stage. So this is about catch. It's not extremely important from the perspective of our project, but we need to keep, need to sort of keep it pushing to some extent. So let's not ignore culture as a factor. Any questions? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not so uh, expert in politeness and uh, aggression, but uh, I will go back to the first session that we had. Yeah. The first session. Yeah. You said that uh, Brown and Levinson framework, like, it's very old. And it's like we should not be using it because it's so universal. And uh, we, when we want to discuss politeness or we want to analyze a text or a discourse, we should be using macro level and uh, micro level. Both. Both micro and macro. Uh, I was interested one day, I made like, uh, I, wa I wanted to do my PhD in politeness, but I have changed into critical discourse analysis, which is not my, our topic. I wanted to analyze well. a kind of uh, uh, advertisement, a comparison, a comparison between Arabic and English advertisement. Yeah. And when I was making like uh, uh, readings, I found a, th a theory by L Brown and Levinson, which works like it's very universal <laughs> and it's very applicable when it comes to uh, advertisement. Uh, which was like uh, Bolton records, positive politeness, negative politeness, off record strategies, indirect speeches, and avoidance, avoidance strategies. So, you are introducing a new framework. I don't, I, I'm not getting it. Are you introducing like a new theoretical framework in, uh, in order to use Adobe to analyze a certain discourse or a certain test, uh, a certain text towards politeness? Uh, and uh, it, it, when you are talking about culture now, I'm trying to relate everything. It's like I should use culture as a point of view when, uh, when, when, when I'm analyzing my text. Uh, culture references should be present. I, I need to uh, understand the theoretical framework that you are using while studying a text toward politeness or impoliteness. And thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I, I would say that, yeah, I mean, we started from Brown and Levinson, and the problem is that you can use them, and it's a good framework, I wouldn't deny, 
But the problem is that if you use Brand and Levinson, you unavoidably expose yourself to criticism because it has been demonstrated that Brand and Levinson has various flows. So, uh, so my problem as well, when I started to do my own research, is that it would be nice to use Brown and Levinson. Yeah. So let's not deny it. But can you use a framework which has been so thoroughly criticized, even if it works? It's just like, for example, using a medicine, which has been tested and works. Side effects. Yeah, but it has side effects, yeah? So it's a kind of questionable approach. What I, I, I'm trying to do now, I'm not sure this particular framework, but I was talking about you know, social practices and things like that, is applicable to advertisements or not. I must admit that's a complete ignorance. I, I've never studied advertisements and they're very interesting. So, um, but surely there are certain frameworks to, to pick up to study advertisements. Now in the case of advertisements, politeness is not an issue that much anyway. I mean, not in a Brown and Levinsonian sense. So Brown and Levinson should not be okay to, to conduct a conversation. I would say a critical discourse analytic study anyway, because Brown and Levinson is interested in, or they are interested in dyadic conversations, so interactions between A and B. But when you study advertisements, it's not dyadic. It's between A, the advertisement, and many people, right? Yes. So I do think that there are very good critical discourse analytic frameworks for these. Uh, for this genre, like third fund age, like, you know, all this stuff. I, I have changed actually yeah. from, uh, a critical discourse framework. Too. Sure, yeah. but I would be worried to use Brown. I mean, even, even if you want to study politeness in, in your data, it's Brown and Levinson are not playing this, this game, so they are not interested in, in this kind of, this type of communication. They're interested in dyadic, dyadic conversations. So I, I, I would struggle to see how you can use Brown and Levinson for this kind of data. Having said this, I mean, if something works for you, then go for it, so I, it's just that there, there, there are some risks behind doing this. So if, you, if you're really eager to study politeness within advertisements, I would study uh, politeness as a situated phenomena in a particular genre. Like, for example, uh, the social practice of advertisements and the situated meanings of, of, of politeness and impoliteness in this particular genre, because you know, it's, it, it seems to be just much safer and more compatible with critical discourse analysis than using Brown and Levinson. Because critical, most of the critical discourse analysts, as far as I know, but I'm not, not one of these people, they are not particularly interested in politeness beyond... Um, in, my, in my new study, I'm not, but I'm thinking about issuing a paper, like sure. issuing a paper, mm. And I have this proposal also, but I'm not going to discuss it. No, no, it no. makes sense, it makes sense. Um, yeah. I, would, I would, instead of going Brown and Levinsonian, I would try to focus on social practice and the situated meanings of politeness. It would get yeah. interesting. Yeah. If you drop me an email, I will be happy to send you some, some materials yeah. about this. Does, does this answer? Or? Yeah, thank you very much. Show off, so it's a pleasure. Any other? Sure. Uh, you know, probably get the accommodation part. So, so you say it again, yeah, sorry. Uh, accommodation. Accommodation, okay. Yeah. okay, okay, okay. So, let's say two people are talking and they are from a different culture, different cultures. So, one person tries to accommodate the other, and the other one tries to accommodate the other. So, like, uh, they create something, right? In between, there's something. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so yeah. There's a lot of accommodate. I mean, it's what I was. <laughs> I mean, what I was talking about is not really accommodation theory. Although you could, I, I never thought about this because I'm not into this theory myself. Okay. But you could surely connect this with accommodation theory as well, so how we make sense to each other, yeah. Well, but it's just, I mean, accommodation theory is very rarely used in politeness nowadays, so this is why I've never picked it up. But having said this, it's, yeah, it might be an interesting approach to see how this kind of data be, can be fitted into, into accommodation theory. Uh, so are you, are you in accommodation theory yourself? <laughs> no way. Okay, well, but, yeah, so, good question, yeah.
I came late, so I'm not sure that uh, if the question I'm going to ask uh, no about this. Uh, <laughs> no uh, for, for the reason that you might have talked about that particular thing that I'm going to ask. That's so, okay. but yeah, uh, you talked about a stereotyping and give an example from probably a movie uh, that was a uh, that was a movie. So, uh, and you were telling that this stereotyping is used to start an argument or a conversation. Okay, so uh, as far as my understanding and, uh, and observation of a stereotyping is concerned, I feel that this is bound to be there in any case, because probably we use a stereotyping for, for I mean in general communication stereotyping uh, happens about people, it's bound to be there for the reason probably for our cognitive, uh, cognitive benefit because we cannot understand each and everything with its all complexity. So the better thing is to stereotype things and then understand that way. So, so that one of the uh, reasons. So, so uh, this stereotyping that always happens there. And so how do, you, how do you see it in terms of uh, politeness and in terms of uh, how would you also uh, capture in the sense that when somebody is talking in terms of stereotyping, what is the thought process behind that? Well, I mean, <laughs> what I was trying to say here, um, so my basic arguments, and, but again, I, 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 I try to build things up from the perspective of our project, is that yeah, culture is present in, 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 in interaction with data in two senses. It's there on the level of social practices, right? It influences the way in which we do things. But on the other hand, it's also there as a resource in order to get things done. And you are absolutely right, absolutely right that, that we, of, we do this all the time. So we use cash as a resource as well to get things done by, by, by uh, st stereotypically contrasting people and people's practices. But we should be careful that this is one kind of understanding of culture. It's not identical with, the, with culture as an underlying notion behind our social practices. So that's my basic argument here, really. But I definitely agree, we do this all the time. Any other question? Or? Uh, hello, sir. Hi. Yeah, as you said, you know, uh, like, if I say that you are very loud, and if I say Hungarians are always loud, so what should be, like, if you said uh, criticism at a national level or, you know, at the like at the lip, uh, under the label of your nationality, would not you know cause much like offense to you. Well, I mean, it depends. I'm sorry for the example. No, no, it's a good example. And thanks for noting this. No, I mean, uh, uh, well, I'd say it's an interesting question actually because we should distinguish two types of faces, and I need to go back to face, although I promise I won't talk about face. There is a personal face and the national face as well, and you can. Oh, upset someone by offending her or his national face as well. When we do stereotypical contrasting this kind of phenomenon, say, you Hungarian guys are always loud, it again depends on the context, whether it's, it's very, very politely or not. Like you could say it as a compliment, say that Indians are loud and you Hungarians are loud as well. That's absolutely face enhancing. So it depends on where, how and why you actually are make an utterance, right? So it's very diff it's again in politeness research, we cannot pre predict things, that's the problem. Uh, we need to be aware of different understandings of culture. So again, this kind of culture as a practice type or sort of identity practice by means of which we get things done. Uh, this may have an ambiguous relationship with politeness. The other sense of, of culture, so the culture as a, as a notion that underlays our social practices as a more straightforward relationship with politeness and impoliteness. Say there is the culture-specific um, pattern of abuse. Then obviously, if we follow this pattern, this culture-specific pattern, it will be interpreted as impolite inherently. And in this sense, or in this case, culture is a more straightforward relationship with 
with the clients, but not in not not when it comes to crisis and discursive resource. That that is answer. Sure. 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 S